and welcome to this section of the Rob and Steve show. This is the section where I'm going to introduce you to a fellow wood turner. Um, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Ruby Claire. And uh, be here. I th appreciate you taking the time to have this short interview with us just to uh, be a part of the Rob and Steve show. I want to try and make it a little bit more professional with regards to uh, the information that we're getting and that we're, that we're handing out to people. Um, from a point of view from somebody that's been turning for a long time. So uh, we can start off with some questions. I think I've got about 10 questions to ask you. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna step out of the camera and uh, I'm gonna hand it all over to you. You can have the limelight for this and I'll just be behind the camera. So uh, we've got some pieces that you've made here. So it's gonna be uh, a lot of fun and interesting for everybody to see. The first question is sort of a two part question. It's how many years have you been turning and what got you started into wood turning? Well, first of all, I started turning in the late 70s, but I didn't do any real turning until the early 80s. With my generation, girls weren't allowed to take shop classes or anything like that um, at school. At the end of high school, I wanted to go into the skilled trades, but I was told don't even apply because they weren't taking girls or women at that time. Even when I went to university, um, I tried to get into engineering and they wouldn't let girls into that program. So most of the stuff I've taken up, I took, took up on my own uh, over the years. And one of the first things I did was I took up carving. And I belong to the Sun Parlor Wood Car Carvers Society. We had about 350 members and some very, very prominent uh, carvers. And these were the type of things that I carved through the club. While I was a member of the carving club, one of the members died. And when I went over to his place to buy some of his tools from his widow, there was a lathe there. And um, even though I didn't know how to use it, I gave her $100 for it. In hindsight, it was a good and bad thing. The lathe was pretty, pretty uh, basic. Um, it didn't have forward and reverse. It didn't have variable speed, and it had the one belt. Uh, the spindle was a 5 8 inch, so you really couldn't even buy a chuck or anything to fit it. But I did play around with it for a bit. After that, I found a few people who got me started on the way, and I started taking classes. And as a result of that, I went out, and my next lathe I bought was the Powermatic 3520. And I was really lucky because Canadian money was at par, uh, and so I went over to the States and bought it. Now, I was also, prior to all of this, into uh, a lot of art, a lot of decorative painting, and basically I ran out of space on the walls, so painting on canvases wasn't practical anymore. So I started turning things that I could paint on, give me new surfaces to paint on. And these are a few of the things that I've painted uh, on my wooden piece. This is a beach bowl that I uh, turned on the lathe and then I hand painted it. Uh, over time it's become a little bit oval but it hasn't affected the paint or uh, how it came out. This piece was uh, painted on a walnut, shallow walnut bowl and um, I did a few of these as Christmas gifts for people. They wanted their puppies painted on them. And then this was a little more realistic one that I was doing with oils and it was painted on just a piece of uh, maple. Okay, so the next question is what kind of training have you had over the years and who have you met and had the opportunity to, uh, to train with? Well, I'm glad you pre-asked me some of these questions because there's a long list of people that I've learned from. I've gone to places such as Craft Supplies USA in Provo, Utah. Uh, I've gone to Aeromont in Tennessee. I've gone to um, Ecole Escalin, which is in France. And uh, basically I'll go anywhere to learn something new. 
For example, when I first wanted to learn how to make the cowboy hats, I tracked down Johannes Mickelson and I drove to his place in Vermont. And uh, as a result, I learned how to make hats. Okay, uh, this one I have to refinish. It's been in the snow and rain and uh, it's gotten a little battered. And as you can see, I made them to fit. One of the most influential people who uh, taught me how to turn was Alan Batty. And from him I learned how to make this secret box. And as you can see, uh, all the sides look pretty much the same. But if you press in the right center, this will come out. And the lid comes off and you have a nice little box. These were popular apparently back in the 1600s. And this one is made out of a full ivory. And it took a little bit of figuring to get it all so that it came out properly. Once it's together, it takes a little while to uh, figure out which button to press to get, your, get to your secret box. Another person who had a lot of influence when my turning was Stuart Mortimer. And from Stuart I learned how to do twisted pieces such as this with the uh, pigtail and how to decorate them and make them look somewhat nice. This was just a plain piece of maple, believe it or not. And then I went on to do this piece with him. This is a piece of acacia and I did this while I was in England visiting him. He taught me how to make the finial out of wood first and how to make the collar in wood, set it in sand and then we poured the silver in to make this. And the same thing basically with the finial. So it was made first in uh, wood and then it was cast. Most people take their vacations to go somewhere south, go on a cruise, something like that. All of my vacations have all been to go and take a turning class somewhere. Or if I, uh, through different clubs that I belong to, take a weekend class that's being offered through the club. So in that manner, I've met such people as uh, Jean-Francois Escalin, Alain Maland, uh, Hans Weisvlog, Chris Dodd, I learned to do boxes from, Malcolm Tibbetts, um, Graham Priddle, Neil Turner, uh, Jean-Claude Charpignon, Paul Textier, Ellie Avicera from uh, Israel, uh, Nick Cook, Betty Scarpino, uh, Ray Keys, and I mean um, Mike Oselik, um the list of people that I've taken classes with either for a week or multiple weeks or just a weekend or one day classes, it's pretty large. I mean, I've, I've just mentioned a few of the people in that and uh, every one of them had a very profound effect on, on what I learned and how I turn and what I do. You know, and the best advice I can give someone, if you want to learn how to turn properly, take a class with somebody who knows what they're doing. Okay, so the next question I have is, uh, is interesting for every turner, because every turner is different. Um, I know my favorite thing to turn has always been a bowl, but just lately I've been wanting to expand into some different areas. So my question to you is, what's your favorite thing to turn at this moment? What I'm doing is I'm still learning how to turn. There are still many things that I want to learn how to make. And most of the time I can look at it something somebody else has turned and I can figure out pretty much how they did it. And if, if I can't figure it out, then that thing really intrigues me. And it was that attitude uh, that got me into turning things such as uh, the Chinese balls, where you have a sphere with uh, five or six or seven spheres inside. And I got, after I learned how to do those, uh, I did one with 13 spheres inside. Um, I w sat one day and I watched uh, Paul Textier from France, who's 
quite elderly uh, attorney and I took photographs of everything he did, the tools he used, which were pretty primitive. And uh, at the end of the day he looked at me and he said, tomorrow you make these. And the next day he sat me down at his lathe with his tools and talked me through uh, making those items. Now even though Paul's in his early 90s, he's still turning and, and creating new things. Uh, these are two pictures he's just sent me recently of things that he's been making at home. And he doesn't have a big lathe, he just has like a small uh, 12 inch lathe at best. Now I mentioned the uh, Chinese balls and the spheres within a sphere. This one has 13 spheres inside. And it took several days to uh, turn all of it. What really intrigued me was though how you turn two spheres and get them interlocking. And I've seen some, if you ever go to the Ecole Escalon in France, across the street is a, a museum on wood turning. And you'll see ones where they have like 12 of these interlocked that have all been turned. And it's just mind-boggling how it's done. Another thing that really interests me is, is doing things like the ornamental turning. And that's how the pattern on this was created and then dyed with ink. And it cre by using different uh, cutters you can create and rosettes you can create these patterns. And to take it one step further, okay, this is a top that was made that way. Hopefully it's the weather's not too bad. Here are, uh, this one was threaded so that you actually have a box. Okay, my next question is a two-part question. It's about how many lathes have you got or how many lathes have you had and what's your favorite tool regarding wood turning? Okay, um, over the course of time I've had nine lathes. I only have six left. I sold off or gave away three of them. Uh, the longest lathe I have is a Powermatic. I needed the length because when I started doing commercial turning like balusters and newel posts I needed something that long. The biggest turning I ever did was a piece 20 inches by 7 feet and it was a trunnion jig for a bridge. And in order to turn that piece of wood which was close to 600 pounds we put the beds of two Powermatic lathes. I remember a conversation from Nick Cook who had done that for a similar turning. And we put those together and with the use of six fellows and a forklift we got the, uh, the wood up on the lathe and it took, took us 12 hours to turn it to the shape the engineer wanted. Uh, then I had in mind I wanted to do some really deep or wide platters and uh, a stubby lathe from Australia came available at a very good price so I, I bought that. And then I have the two king lathes. I have the uh, mini king lathe which has an 8 inch swing. You can do pens and small items on it. I've done pepper mills and small bowls on it as well as pens. And then I have the mid-sized king lathe that I demo at most of the wood shows. Uh, it has a 12 inch swing and uh, it's a very nice stable little lathe. I also have two homemade rose engine. Probably my two favorite tools would be the uh, beading parting tool and uh, a badan. I learned from uh, Jean-Francois Esclin how to use a badan and I find it so useful for so many little things. Um, next in line would probably be my uh, spindle gouges, my roughing spindle gouge, my bowl gouge. Uh, I have several bowl gouges ground at different angles depending on uh, 
you know, the, what type of bowl or hol holoform I'm using them on. Um, and I've come to like the skew quite a bit. I was fortunate I was taught how to use it properly. And um, I try and teach people how to use it the same way I was taught. Okay, so the next question is, what would be the first advice or the best advice that you could give to a new turner? The first thing I'd say to a new turner is don't buy any equipment. Go somewhere and take lessons. Uh, like Craft Supplies USA, you can take one-week classes. Um, Aeromont in Tennessee. Um, you can take classes at the Lee Valley stores. Uh, or if you find a really good turner, uh, take classes from them. Um, I really hesitate to, to advise watching YouTube. There are a few people on YouTube who are good, such as Theo Haralampu Her and Wayne Clasper and that. Um, because I've seen a lot of turners on, on YouTube who, I hate to say it, they turn the wrong direction for the grain. And it bothers me, that, or, or they don't take safety precautions. Like they're not wearing a full face mask and they're turning something like a wing bowl. And if that ever let loose, I mean, somebody's going to get hurt. And that's not the way to start out learning. You're better to have somebody there who can guide your hands and guide your tool through the cuts and make you understand why you're cutting in the direction that you're cutting. We were talking about grain direction, and grain direction is highly important. It determines how you make all of your cuts. So for example, this little ball is what's called a side grain ball. On a tree, the bark would have been on this side, okay? So the tree would have grown in this direction. And in certain areas, you can think of this pencil as being like the tree, okay, grew in this direction. It determines how you would cut, make the cuts to create this ball. So for example, if I were cutting this pencil, I would never cut across like this. I wouldn't cut this way to sharpen it. I would be making all of my cuts in this direction. So if you think about the bowl being that way, to shape the back of the bowl, your cuts are made in this direction. And when you get to the center of the bowl, in order to hollow it, you're, ho you're hollowing going this way into the bowl. Okay? Now, when you do a spindle turning, okay, and this is basically a spindle turning, the grain direction now is going this way on the lathe. So if we look at this spindle as basically being the same as a pencil, the grain direction going this way. The grain direction determines which way we cut each of the parts. So on the pencil we turn from this high or we cut this way in order to sharpen the pencil. If we cut the other direction it'll uh, it'll break out. So when we're turning the parts on this we turn from the high area such as on this bead to this side from the high that way. From up here, we turn from high in this direction. Same thing here, we turn this way. When we make this set of beads here, we turn from high to low, high to low. When we're turning uh, this section here, okay, the pencil is like this, we're turning from the high here this way. So grain direction is highly important. Okay, so if we look at this hollow form, which is kind of a deep bowl really, this is what's called an end grain bowl. The tree grew this way, okay, the grain direction is this way. You can tell by the pith in the bottom of it, all right? So when it's on the lathe and we're turning it, we have to think of it as being the pencil like this. 
and on the pencil, when you sharpen a pencil, you sharpen from high to low. So when you were turning this piece, you would do the same thing. Your cuts would be in this direction. If I tried to cut this way, it would be like, okay, if this, it would be like cutting this way and it would tear the grain out. Okay, same thing on a pencil. If you tried to sharpen a pencil in this direction, the wood on the top here would just peel off. So you have to understand this and know it when you go to make a piece to know which way to turn. Now, when you do the inside of this, okay, you have to think of it uh, once again as being a pencil over here. So to sharpen a pencil, you would sharpen from here coming out. So the same thing happens on the inside here. You would go into the center and your cuts would come outward. All right. It took me a long time to get this. In fact, I had a diagram behind my lathe so I would look at it and say, okay, I'm turning a side grain or an end grain piece and determine which way I had to make my cuts. Now it's automatic. This piece, it's got a natural edge as well, but the grain of the tree goes this way. It's the exact opposite. Okay? So, you have to think of it as, um, okay, once again, like our pencil. So, um, okay, actually, if I put the pencil sideways. So, our cuts are this way in this direction to make the bottom. Okay? So it's like cutting this side of the uh, pencil. And when we get to the inside, okay, the, the pencil is like this. So we'd make our cuts from the high, which would be out here, down in this way. So it's the exact opposite of that other piece. And these are probably the hardest concepts that you have to learn, but they determine whether or not how your cuts come out. So that's going to help also in when it comes down to sanding and finishing. Oh, absolutely. If you, if you make really nice clean cuts in the proper direction, first you don't clack, um, crack or split your wood, and a really good cut with a sharp tool, sometimes you can start sanding with 180 or 220 paper. Now it comes down to tool choice and presentation of the tools to make items like this. Now I know for a fact that the grain direction on this ran this way. So my cuts had to be, I had to know what direction to cut in in order to um, form these petals on this flower. The same thing on the whale's tails. When it was mounted on the lathe, it was mounted like this. Okay. So my tool, my, my cuts had to go from high to low, high to low, and then come down here. Same thing when I, when I went this way on the inside. Okay. And you can't turn things like this if your tool's not cutting in the right direction. Uh, these kind of things, to turn them with a carbide, would be pretty much impossible. Carbide tools have their place. Carbide tools were, you know, are basically scrapers, and scrapers were developed for purposes of, of um, turning very, very hard woods, like if you turn ebony or ivory or the really hard rose woods, um, carbide tools are per the perfect tools to be using for those, especially for ebony. Regular tools, it tends to chip it. But um, they were never designed for using on softer woods like soft maples, cedar, walnut, even some cherry. Um, things like that, or pine. So knowing what the tool was designed for and when to use it is sort of critical. 
And unfortunately, a lot of people are sold tools that don't suit what they're trying to do, and then they, they wonder why they're experiencing difficulty. Um, the other thing is that if you're using the wrong tool, uh, like a carbide on a soft wood, you can end up having to start with 40 grit sandpaper instead of 220. Okay, so my next question really is just for you. Obviously, it's going to be different for everybody around the world, but what is the best and the worst woods that are available to you for wood turning? That's an interesting question. Um, local woods, I like to turn things like cherry, a very hard maple. Um, if I can get my hands on exotic woods, I would, I would love to have some boxwood, um, some lignum vitae, uh, any of the rosewoods like cocobolo, uh, because you can turn such fine detail in them with ease. Uh, the woods that I really don't like to turn, probably like a maple that is, um, it's not just spalted, but it's, it's gone punky. Um, same thing with like a very old pine or cedar or something that's, that's gotten dried out. Uh, it's been sitting in a barn forever. Uh, those I, I don't enjoy. They create a lot of dust, they crack and split, and uh, you can't make fine cuts with them. Even though you cut properly, you still get tear out. So I, I prefer the more expensive woods, I guess is what it comes down to. A lady with expensive tastes. Yes. <laughs> okay, so the next question is, if you could describe the most difficult thing that you have to deal with when you're wood turning. Uh, the very most difficult would be figuring out how to turn uh, something that's totally out of the normal realm. Like I mentioned earlier, the trunnion jig for the bridge, it was 20 inches in diameter, but it was 7 feet long. And it was through listening to a conversation I had with Nick Cook one night, um, where he told me about how he put two lathe beds together. And I took that idea, another student of mine had the same lathe, we put those two lathes together and using a forklift and a chain fall and six people we managed to get the wood up onto the lathe. Now that wood was close to 600 pounds. Um, and it took, well, four of us 12 hours to turn it. We took two um, tool rests and we separated them the full length of the two beds and then we took a two inch solid steel rod and we chained those to the tool rests and that was what we used to turn. Um, second thing I find really hard to t deal with is rotten wood. Um, you get into it and you have in mind you're going to make one shape and then you find out where the body of what you're making isn't there because it's a huge void the uh, bugs have created inside it or it's just so rotten it's falling apart and you can't make what you want to. I find that frustrating. Sometimes it allows you to be more creative though. Okay, we were talking about uh, ring shake and, and cracks that can happen in the wood. This is the way this tree grew. So the center of the tree would be here. Now you have your annual rings, the way you tell the age of a tree, that go in this direction. Now when I was making this piece, the cracks didn't show up that were in the, uh, in the rings from how the tree was felled. If you look closely, the rings on the tree, okay, the growth rings go this way. And you can see right along this ring here, okay, is that visible? You can see where it's starting to crack. Well, that ring goes all the way down, and on the opposite side here, I think it's even more visible, you can see that same ring is cracked. So like this was a bowl that I had roughed out and was going to return. 
I'm just throwing it into the firewood pile because this wool will come apart either while I'm turning it or down the road and it's just not worth the time and effort to finish it. You can see how the cracks have extended right into the center. Now I know some people who will fill it with epoxy or resins and they'll try and save it. Honestly, I just don't think it's worth it. And rather than take a chance on getting hurt, I just soon toss it. Okay, so to wrap this interview up, I'd like to ask you two questions in one, and that would be who would be the two most influential people that have influenced your turning and styles and, and, and everything? And what do you think can be done to bring more people into uh, wood turning? Unfortunately, Alan Batty's already passed away. Uh, Alan was like a 14th generation turner, but even after he retired as a turner, he spent many years teaching other people all over the world um, his skills and he was a, an excellent teacher. Uh, Stuart Mortimer is much the same way. Stuart learned how to turn. Uh, his turning is of the highest quality you'll find anywhere in the world. Um, same thing with Jean-Francois Esclin or uh, Alain Milan or Jean-Claude Charpignon or many other people. But I think what strikes me about all of these people that uh, I've come across who have taught me and influenced me greatly, the one thing they did not have was they didn't have a swollen head. They realized they were skilled. They didn't lord it over anyone. They just went about their business of sharing their skill and teaching and trying to teach properly and make sure that people understood the concepts they were teaching. And I greatly have to admire these people and the time and effort that they put into it. A lot of people don't realize that when you teach or demonstrate, there's a lot of work that went into it but long before the demonstration occurs. And uh, the care that these people take and their attitudes, you know, I admire them all very, very much. So the last part of that question was what can be done to bring more people into wood turning? Okay, I think um, one of the most important things is to have more demonstrations. The existence of wood turning clubs where they meet once a month, uh, they have someone who's a good turner will demonstrate different principles. They also have mentoring programs where uh, people can pick up the skill and and learn from other good turners within the club. Like I said, be very careful when you pick people to watch on YouTube uh, because there are good turners and bad turners. There are some people I couldn't even watch their whole, the whole demo. It was Terrible. so bad. Terrible. <laughs> no, yours were not one of those. <laughs> um, I'll pay you later. <laughs> Gee, thanks. <laughs> No, but seriously, uh, it really bothers me to see somebody teaching others how to do something incorrectly or unsafely. Yeah, and a lot of the videos that are out there, if you look at the video description, will say for entertainment purposes only. So it's really hard to know if you're watching. You've got you to gotta be aware of what you're watching, whether it's just for entertainment purposes or if it's a genuine teacher. Right. And I try to de decipher a lot of that myself and it's good to have you as a friend that has got so much knowledge and background in in the field so i really appreciate your uh, interview today well Ruby. thank you thank you very much i i enjoy teaching in case you hadn't noticed i had noticed that you enjoy it yes um you were a teacher at one point were you not yeah i taught school for 36 years and uh it seems everything i've gotten into whether it was the scuba diving the uh the skiing, the painting, uh, the carving, uh, the turning, uh, even golf, I end up teaching some, some aspect or another. It's, mm. I guess it's in the blood. Touching on scuba diving, that you were on a TV show, were you not? Yeah, back in the early 70s and 80s, uh, we filmed the TV series The Last Frontier. The Last Frontier. It was a documentary. Um, a Canadian documentary that was all filmed underwater. 
And it was kind of neat because we traveled all over the world. And I got to dive in a lot of places a lot of people don't normally get to dive. And it was not a job traditional for a female to be chosen, particularly back in that time period. And uh, I, I have to say I enjoyed it tremendously. All right. Well, we're wrapping this up now, and I hope you guys got something out of the, this interview. I know I did. It's always interesting, and uh, there's always something to learn. So uh, keep on learning and turning, and yes. be safe. Take care. Thank you. Okay. So the... Did I press record? Yeah, I did. <laughs> You can leave that part in. <laughs> yeah, I uh, probably will. Because <laughs> that's a spindle. Right. Do you see my stool sample? <laughs> uh, yeah, I've... I've uh, I know a lot of people have done it. It's nothing new. Yeah, it, it, it's nothing I new. remember the first one I saw of those was 20-some years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. I know it's nothing new. But I, I like the idea. In fact, I'm going to dig one of my... Uh, medicine bottle so mm. yeah yeah well I, I got the idea actually it was on Steve's this is not record oh it is recording <laughs> uh, yeah, cut this part out yeah I'll just shut it off for a minute um, um, lately I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos and I've seen some people doing things very wrong and um, it bothers me that they're learning from the wrong things and that they might possibly get injured because of it. Uh, there are some other people out there who are doing an excellent job, such as Theo Hara Lampu from uh, Australia. Um, his turning is spot on. He, his tool control, his explanations are worth somebody watching.